All right, everyone. So today we have Tim Wong, uh, and we are live from Tim Wong's apartment <laughs> in San Francisco. <laughs> um, all right, man. So I think the easiest way to do this is just to introduce yourself. Okay, cool. Uh, so, well, thanks for having me on the show, Craig. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Huang. I'm a global public policy lead on AI and machine learning for Google. And so what do you do for your job? Uh, so public policy is a pretty fun job. It's a combination of a couple different things. Um, on one hand, uh, I work a lot with sort of governments and regulators uh, and civil society, trying to figure out actually like what you know, Google's position should be on a whole range of issues, everything from, you know, whether or not uh, machine learning is going to take all the jobs mm -hmm. uh, to uh, whether or not, you know, we can make sure that these systems are uh, fair and non-discriminatory. Um, and then internally, I work with product teams and researchers to kind of keep them apprised of what's happening uh, on the political scene worldwide. Okay. And so what does that mean? Does that mean traveling around and meeting with people? How do you find that? Yeah, out? it's a lot of meeting with people, actually. So um, we end up kind of talking with people from a whole range of different kind of sectors and a whole range of different backgrounds, um, particularly because AI is, uh, you know, this kind of emerging technology. Um, a lot of what we're doing is kind of just trying to assess like how different parts of society are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think the with AI you, and then policy on AI, you've kind of like nested two obscure things that people don't really know what you're talking <laughs> about. So uh, could you just back up a little bit and explain like what doing policy for Google actually means in the context of AI? Uh, sure, definitely. So, uh, you know, I think the really interesting thing about AI is basically that um, you know, a lot of the modern techniques in artificial intelligence, if you even asked people like a decade ago, they would have told you like, this is never going to be a thing. It's a complete dead end. Why are you doing this research? Uh, and it really has kind of exploded in a, in a completely unexpected way in the last few years. Mm -hmm. And so really a lot of the challenge has been like, okay, everybody's kind of wrapping their heads around what the, you know, even what the business impact of the technology is going to be. But there's increasingly a lot of people trying to figure out like what the social impact of the technology will be. And I would say policy really sits at that interface mm -hmm. between these really cool technological capabilities that are coming about and then like what society in general is going to do about it. And so what would be like a tangible example at Google of like a policy that you guys have worked on to, to figure out? Uh, sure. So uh, there's a couple of really interesting problems that we've been, we've been working on very closely. So one of them is this question about fairness in machine learning systems. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, to give you one really concrete challenge we've been thinking a lot about is uh, in order to uh, de-bias a system, right? Once a machine learning system is behaving in a biased way, mm -hmm. one way of trying to deal with it is collecting more diverse data. Okay. But one of the big problems is when you do that, you end up collecting lots and lots of data about minorities, which raises all these really interesting questions around privacy and, and what have you. And that ends up being a really interesting problem because it's both a technical challenge, right? Which is like, can you collect an adequately diverse data set? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, like also this policy question, which is what is society comfortable with you collecting? And like, what are the practices? And that ends up being a really interesting trade-off mm -hmm. um, that you have to navigate if you're interested in these problems. And so what do you actually have to do? Like, are you going doing like user interviews with people or is it just uh, guessing? Yeah, part of it's user interviews. Part of it's actually working with like people who know, right? Like it turns out that issues of privacy, particularly minority privacy are like not new problems right and so a lot of our work is actually like talking with people who are like experts in that space right people have worked on you know bias and discrimination questions on the past uh, and a lot of data scientists and trying to get them to talk to one another because i think we're right now what we're really trying to do is kind of bridge these sort of human values on one hand with like a lot of what's happening on the technological side and so if i'm a company and i'm like i can't afford a policy guy like tim and I will be dealing with large amounts of data that may or may not discriminate against people. Mm -hmm. Are there any like obvious no goes that you would tell someone? Well, I think it's uh, it's to be sure that you're like interrogating the data, right? Like I think that's like one important place to start. Yeah. Now I think one of the interesting things about machine learning is that there's like lots of potential points of failure, and like I think every single interesting point of failure is being investigated right now. Um, but I mean, it, one of the most common problems is just that you don't adequately think through your data. Mm -hmm. And so the machine does what the machine does, right? Which is just trying to optimize against your objective function that you give it. And, and it will often maximize in ways that you don't expect. And that is, in fact, part of the problem, right? So, I mean, one of the examples that I always think about is, uh, you know, we have this project uh, that we released. It was called Deep Dream. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems in computer vision is trying to figure out, like, what the computer actually thinks it sees when it looks at an image. And so you go through this process and you basically, the whole process, you show it an image, you ask it like, what do I have to do this image to make it look more like what you think, for example, a sandwich looks like? Mm -hmm. And you edit the image slightly and you keep repeating this process until, you know, kind of you show out like what is the ideal thing mm -hmm. that the computer thinks it is. And 
it turns out that when when you ask it to see like ask it to reveal what like it thinks a barbell looks like you know barbells always show up with human arms attached to them oh, wow. right yeah and so like that's a really interesting problem right because you've trained barbells on photos yeah. that always have someone holding the barbell and so it ends up learning this completely bad representation and what do you got to do? I mean, a big part of it is just like the consciousness around like, oh, that can happen. Right. And like, how do you interrogate your data set to make sure it doesn't have those problems? And you guys are doing some interesting stuff around adversarial data, right? Yeah, that's right. So, I, I mean, I think adversarial examples and generative adversarial networks are like some of the hottest points in the research right now. Mm -hmm. It's almost become a joke that there's like just like so many what they call GANs out there right now. This is like every everybody has a GAN. So what does that mean? What does that stand for? So a general adversarial network. So it's a very particular way of kind of setting up machine learning um, but uh, adversarial examples uh, lead to these really fascinating results where you know you can take a picture of a panda and that's a classic example and you edit a couple of the pixels and it like basically like the, the computer will be like yep that's definitely a giraffe <laughs> right? and it still looks like a panda to humans right yeah. which is the really fascinating thing and so what data are you seeding into that image to make it think it's giraffe well, a lot of it, I think, is basically you're editing particular pixels within the image mm -hmm. that we know will set off the machine to behave in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So because it turns out basically that like we always assume that a computer will see the same thing that we do um, just based on the visuals. But how we process is actually completely different from from machines. Um, this researcher, David Weinberger, did this awesome article recently, which is basically trying to argue that like. You know, machine learning, it, it's its generating knowledge, but one of the most interesting things about it is that it's generating knowledge in maybe a way that, like, is completely different from our the way our human brains work. And, like, that ends up being a really interesting challenge is, like, how do you, like, understand the knowledge that you're getting and how do you understand, like, the reasoning behind the knowledge that you're getting from machine learning systems? Well, that, and maybe that's a sensible segue into, like, how people are investigating the impact of AI mm -hmm. as it relates to, like, automation and what humans are good at doing and what computers are good at doing. Yeah, right. And so when you travel around, you meet with people, you meet with different countries, like, sure. how are people gauging the effects of automation and AI right now and, and, and its effects over the next, like, you know, decade? Yeah, I think, um, so it's an evolving picture, yeah. right? And I think right now, I think everybody is just surprised at all of the things that machines can do that we thought that humans were going to be good at for the foreseeable future, yeah. right? So like Go is the canonical example, okay. but there's all sorts of really interesting kind of like reasoning and other things that like machines are engaging in now. And, uh, and so one thing I always tell people is basically that everybody always wants to think about AI as if it were like this huge meteor just crashing into the earth where they're like, what do we do when the AI arrives, right? And it just like, it doesn't just in terms of that it doesn't work like that, right? And in fact, like what we really need to get to is like thinking about like how particular, you know, technical capabilities will map onto the economy. And that's what a lot of the work is happening on right now. Okay. And so, yeah, let's go into some examples. Yeah, sure. So, so for example, one really interesting question is this adversarial examples, yeah. right? Which is basically like everybody always assumes that like, okay, if it can be automated, it definitely will be automated, right? But that's like a fallacy because in certain cases, like you may really worry about the security of your systems, right? So if someone, for example, can like, hold up a photo and cause like a security camera to be like, oh, it's definitely Tim, open the door, <laughs> right? Like that ends up being a real reason why you would not necessarily want to implement a machine learning system for, you know, access control, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so that's actually really interesting because that means that if we don't solve that research problem, that means that we will be limited in the kind of domains that machine learning enters into. Mm. And I think that's what we're really interested in right now is like, what are these kind of gateway research questions that if we got through mm. would like totally change the nature of like who, when, and why someone would implement this stuff. And so are those things collecting the interest and like the momentum of the research community? Because like... I can see a certain direction where it becomes incredibly product focused, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm like, I'm a researcher, I'm incredibly talented. Yeah. Like figuring out if the security camera is gonna work with an adversarial network, mm -hmm. like maybe not, uh, might not be of highest interest yeah, to me. Right, right. Is that like blocking people or is like the general concept enough? Uh, I mean, I think right now it's a little bit unevenly divided, right? Okay. It turns out that like research interest is not necessarily like policy relevant sure. interest, right? And so. In some cases, they're overlapping, right? So I think there's a lot of interest in adversarial examples. There's a lot of interest in like, what are attacks essentially that you can put on these machines to get them to behave in ways that you don't expect. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a place where like security, which is like very much a policy interest, mm -hmm. will map on quite nicely to security as like a research interest. Okay. But for example, things like fairness, right? Like I was talking to a machine learning researcher the other day who was basically like, look, I could not in good faith advise a grad student to work on machine learning fairness issues hmm. because it's not just it's just not considered a serious problem in the field right and like that's just like that has less to do with like the field and more like 
the norms of the field, right? And then that that ends up being a big issue, right? right? We don't have coverage on certain types of things, and in, in practice, may actually really limit like where these technologies are are implemented. Well, I think it's a it's a material issue right now. Like, there's a gap between product understanding and like actual deep research. Yeah, that's right. And I, I say this to a lot of people, like you know, everybody's always like, so what skills do we need to teach people in the future because of machine learning? And I think like one enormous skill will be like domain knowledge because like coming up with like a technical capability is just like one part of this huge picture, right? Which is just like, okay, so then like, how do we actually introduce automation in a way that like makes sense to people? And like, that's like a huge task. And so I know my personal prediction is that like interface and like how we effectively collaborate with machines, particularly with these two new types of models, mm-hmm. um, like how that effectively done is still a big open question and will seem to be increasingly in higher demand as you suddenly have access to these capabilities, right? So what I've been wondering then is like, does, for example, like, you know, TensorFlow or, you know, uh, any one of like the, the machine learning APIs, mm-hmm. um, does that become the new AWS for products or do people have to build their own to create like a defensible company? Um, I mean, I think there's still like, so, I mean, like cloud services will have the same impact on the economy that they always have. Right. And I think this is one interesting thing is all these companies are now competing for offering cloud ML services. Yeah. And the upshot of that basically is that the like amount of like, you don't need a PhD in machine learning to get all the benefits from machine learning. Right. And I think that will shape the space for sure. Okay, yeah. cool. So then what are the other areas like aside from, um, aside from the first one we talked about? for automation and work mm-hmm. like where, where are other people interested right now? well so i think i'm the other thing we're really interested in uh and i'm really interested in is kind of like is it possible to pull off machine learning with less and less data mm-hmm. right and so you know there's a couple examples of that but one of them is like one shot learning right where people are basically working on the ability to teach machines but like a much smaller number of examples now that actually has a really big impact on the game because that means that you can implement machine learning effectively in situations where it's like really expensive to collect lots of data. There's also one really cool interface between VR and AI that's happening right now where the whole idea is like uh, there's a project called uh, Universe from OpenAI and another project called DeepMind Lab, mm-hmm. which basically like imagine you need to teach a robot to get through a maze. Well, you could have it physically run through that maze millions of times, or you could just have a virtual 3D environment that you cause a computer to run through, and it learns how to do that in virtual space, and then basically you you put it into uh, in practice in, in a real robot. And so that's a really another exciting way where you don't necessarily need like an expensive physical setup to collect the data that you need mm. in order to accomplish tasks in the real world. Okay. So then what, like, I, I guess what I'm curious about then is like, how are these countries like preparing for mm-hmm. this like you know again not a meteor strike mm-hmm. but like perhaps a gradual shift over 20 years 30 mm-hmm. years um to a very different world than what we have right now yeah and i think you're right now you're seeing like a bunch of different ideas out in the space um you know some for example like basic income right universal basic income which would like fundamentally reshape you know like the social contract and how we think about doing for example like welfare in a whole number of countries. Mm-hmm. And like, so you see book proposals like that. Uh, I think you see a number of proposals that are more like focusing on education. Mm-hmm. So like, what are skills that people would need in the space? And that, that ranges from everything from like, everybody needs to be a programmer to like, oh, well, we need to really encourage like computational thinking, right? Which is like the ability to work effectively with data. Uh, right. Okay. And so like, there's a couple of different options out there. Some of the more interesting ones uh, that I've heard of that are a little bit more obscure, right? Like, so some people have said like, oh, well, maybe we need like automation insurance. Yeah. So in the future, your employer will provide you with like a contract that says, if your job turns out to be replaced by AI at some point in the future, um, we'll pay out at some kind of rate. Right. So people are like experimenting with lots of options right now. I think what we actually need in the space is like more experimentation. Mm. So for even proponents of basic income, a lot of them will tell you like, we actually don't know in practice what this would look like if it were actually rolled out at any level of scale. Mm. And so like, I mean, it's cool seeing YCR and a couple other places like experiment with this. Mm-hmm. And so where, um, where is the traction happening then with all of these experiments? Like I, it seems very limited, but is it all like in Northern Europe or I know there's a basic income study in India mm-hmm. at this point. Um, who seems to be focusing most on this area? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of different uh, countries engage in this. Yeah. Um, I think Northern Europe is kind of leading the way in terms of their willingness to kind of experiment with some of these models. And I think it, they've got a couple things going for them, right? Like on one hand, I think they have uh, a skilled labor force, mm-hmm. right? That like uh, is is relatively expensive, right? So I think that they are seeking uh, 
and excited about AI in large part because it's a prospect to bring, for example, manufacturing back to the country, mm -hmm. right? Because it allows them to compete on the same footing as like other countries that have offered like lab labor for like much lower costs, right? Right. So like that's one thing that that's that's good for them. I think the other thing that's also encouraging a lot of experiments is that they have a lot more coordination mm -hmm. between government, industry, and labor, which is making it more possible to experiment with these sorts of things. So I think in, in a really interesting case, like it, it turns out that maybe Northern Europe is actually a little bit ahead in its ability to. To kind of experiment understand some of these programs and then as a like google or alphabet as like this international institution at this point how are you guys thinking about interacting with different countries as this happens yeah so we're, we're investigating at the moment yeah. right so the question is who on the research side should we be working with yeah and what are kind of programs that we could support yeah. that will help us give a better handle on this picture right because i think like look ultimately like it's a technology company Right. And so we know that we don't have all the talents necessary to like evaluate like, you know, what is a proper like social welfare program. But on the other hand, we think we think it's actually really important that we like encourage a better societal understanding of like how to deal with these technologies. And so so I think we're very much in the mode of like, how can we support this? OK. And I think that's partially through potentially resources, but also potentially like expertise as well. Right. Like we if, if you want to know anything about machine learning, we got people who can tell you about that. Now we have to marry that up with people who have a good understanding of how this will impact society, either through economics or otherwise. Mm. And do you ever feel like the information you're disseminate, disseminating is like guiding the conversation and guiding the future? Or like people are like playing into the game like it's intentional oh. or it's just like opened up. And, yeah. I mean, I think it's very open, right? I mean, I think like, you know, I think it's easy, particularly in the Valley to be like, oh my God, these big companies. But like, we're only one part of a much larger, larger picture about what's happening in the economy. I like totally think that's the case, yeah. right? Like, you know, like we talk about AI and automation, but we might also want to talk about like demographic shifts happening in the economy. Like what's it mean that we have an aging workforce, right? Mm -hmm. Or like, what's it mean that we have like falling workforce participation in the United States, right? Like those are actually trends that like, that are almost as large as like what someone comes up with a lab and presents at a machine learning conference. And so like, I think it's actually really important that like we look at this all in a bigger perspective. Mm, okay. And so uh, what do you guys do to like keep that in mind? I imagine you just have like a, a whole policy team to manage that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, kind of what we're responsible for is like keeping track of a lot of this stuff. Okay. Right? And like getting a better understanding of like who is researching in the space. Because hmm. um, as I said, you know, like I think we're still really early on in this technology, right? Like, again, if you had asked someone 10 years ago whether or not neural nets were going to be a thing, they'd be like, yeah, I don't know. It probably wouldn't work, right? But like if we're at a phase right now where like suddenly it has become technically real, I think now that understanding is just starting to percolate out to a bunch of other fields who are like, okay, well, I guess this, we now we've got to assess what's going on. Mm. And so do you see companies and, and organizations and countries like locking their gates because they're scared because it feels new? Like it's obviously massively hyped, but there's also some reality behind it. Um, has there been a negative reaction? Yeah, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I think by and large, what we're seeing is that a lot of governments are just really curious. They actually want a better understanding of what's going on. Okay. So in many cases, I think what we're seeing is like people asking, you know, like what is happening in the technology? Okay. So I think, you know, the phase of what to do about it is still on its way. Right. So that you like give them, you know, the PowerPoint deck and they're like, oh, okay, I kind of get how this works. And then they go <laughs> home, you know, whatever to like Japan and they're like, okay. Do you think about it? That's well, how it yeah, works? Yeah, I think so. I mean, this is how government progresses, okay. right? Is like, I think like they ask questions, they get information, and then there's like a long process of figuring out what you do around it. Right. Uh, but I mean, I, that isn't to say like there isn't like laws and other regulations being passed that have relevance mm -hmm. for machine learning, right? So one of the most interesting aspects of the GDPR, which is a new privacy regulation in Europe, is uh, the potential for this, what they call kind of a right to explanation. So the idea is for certain kinds of automated decision making, it might be so significant as to require or give citizens the right for uh, that system to be able to produce some kind of human understandable explanation for what it's doing. Mm -hmm. And like that raises all sorts of interesting challenges about like how you actually pull that off. And so like I would say that I don't want to make it sound like no governments are taking action, but I think like that's that's the beginning part of it, right? Like and I think like by and large, the stance of most governments have been to like understand what's going on. Hmm. So. Do you think someone's doing it particularly well now? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was really excited by some of the stuff happening out of the UK. So last year they actually did a report that was on kind of like giving a, an account of like the risks and opportunities mm -hmm. from artificial intelligence. And I think it was like a really good account of that. So, and then last year with the, uh, under the Obama administration, um, there was a really good uh, report that they did as well on the topic. Okay. And so like, 
Can you go specific on that? Like, uh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think the what we at least have it in the uh, what we at least had in the the U.S. case, right, was basically a report that like really focused in on like, okay, what are the real concrete risks here? Yeah. And part of the idea was to pivot away from discussions that were just like, okay, the main thing we've got to talk about here is whether or not robots are going to destroy us, right? Like, or decide to take over, right? right yeah. Which I agree is like kind of an interesting scenario to consider, but like. You're right, like there's a lot of like core near-term problems that need to be dealt with. And I think that was one thing that it did that was very useful, so. Well, aside from the stuff we've talked about, mm. where what do you find to be particularly exciting, both like here, like at a, you know, local Bay Area level, mm. uh, as far as like research, and then at, you know, global international research level, moving this stuff forward? Mm, yeah. So I think there's two things that I find really interesting right now. One of them uh, is the intersection of machine learning and art, mm -hmm. right? So like largely this is a technology we've been using to solve like pretty pragmatic things, right? Which is like, how do we ensure that we can adequately recognize like cats in photos? Yeah. Um, but like what's really interesting is a bunch of people are kind of playing around right now with the intersection between like, oh, could I use this for like artistic purposes? Mm -hmm. So there's a really fun project. Uh, uh, Google has this project called AI Experiments, which is a lot of kind of like small things like this, which kind of demonstrate the kind of artistic possibilities of technology. Mm -hmm. We also have another program called Magenta, which is looking into machine learning and music mm -hmm. and like whether or not there's ways of kind of creating better creative collaboration between humans and machines on that front. Hmm. And, and have you experimented with it personally? Uh, yeah, some of it's really fun. There's one project which is basically like a melody generator. Like you play some notes on a piano and then the computer will play alongside you. Like harmonize with you? Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, right, oh, right. And melody. so you kind of like improvise with the, with the computer, which is super cool. Uh, there's another project called Marauder Cam, which you get on your phone, okay. which is like you take a couple of photos of things in the room and it produces this like bop in like electronic dance hit that has like that uses the words of the objects in the room as like a rhyming, you know, set of lyrics. Oh, super cool. Yeah. And a great example of like how the technology is becoming like really accessible. Because again, if you wanted to like, do that like 10 years ago, it would have required like a huge amount of money and like, you know, a bunch of PhDs to try to work on this problem. Right. Yeah. I'm, I've been fascinated with that, like how it's become distributed just even in the past like year. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I, you know, I told you about all the speech to text stuff that I'm working on. Yeah. No, like, it's... Man, like the fidelity of it is shocking. Yeah. That's just right. in like one year. Right. Right. And so it's gotten like way better, which I think is super interesting. Um, I think the other thing is also like trying to figure out like uh, there's these like really unexpected things that emerge too. So the other thing that's I think is really cool right now is there's a paper that came out from DeepMind I think earlier this year that was kind of like if you get two machines to talk to one another they will eventually like, and you can set up another computer to basically say like oh I can read what you're saying I can't read what you're saying. You can basically train these two systems to come up with the rudiments of encryption without even necessarily needing to program encryption into the computers. Which is also like super Whoa. cool as well. They, they they learn how to accomplish that task, and it's not like very good encryption, but like the basics are basically learned by these systems. So long as you give them good reinforcement on like, okay, that's still cognizable. I can still understand what you're saying, right. versus like a third party being like, oh, I can't do that. Oh um, man. Yeah. And so, do you have thoughts on like how this will become distributed in such a way that? any day like we'll be interacting with it in our everyday lives as just like fun projects like will it be existing in the art space will like be uh you know like training new programming languages for folks to work on when they're younger yeah i mean i think like there's there's you know i was talking to peter norvig who is like one of the researchers we have is like one of the you know founding fathers of ai and he had this really interesting thought which is basically that like we may be approaching the period where we actually have to entirely rethink how we teach computer science because like machine learning is such a powerful tool and also cognitively, it works in a way that's like totally, uh, you know, counterintuitive, right? So like I do less software than I used to, but like definitely when I was in the trenches doing coding work, it was very much like, okay, like let's get a bunch of smart people in the room. Let's come up with a bunch of rules and then like let's get those rules into the machine versus this much different kind of mode of thought right which is basically like let's present the machine with a bunch of examples and then verify whether or not the machine has learned the proper lesson right. and so his idea is like actually we may actually really want to think about how we re like think about cs from like the very first moment you step into a classroom mm -hmm. which i think is like a super compelling idea because it was always thought of like oh machine learning is just going to become this complement mm -hmm. to like how you do uh, programming mm -hmm. but i wonder whether or not software in the future will actually look more and more 
like machine learning focused, right? And like you actually change your entire approach to programming systems. Oh man, that's fascinating. I mean, it, it's already kind of gone that way in that like many CS programs are so technical, you actually never build a web app. Like, yeah, that's right. Like you can go through Stanford CS and never build a web yeah, app. Yeah, and I think it's a very natural trend that like, you know, we're getting to higher and higher levels of abstraction. Yeah. So like in some ways, machine learning is this like ultimate level of abstraction where it's like, even if you wanted to understand what's happening in like a neural net, <laughs> like it might be actually like kind of difficult to do so, right? So, yeah, I mean, I guess so. But I, I see it becoming like there's just new ways of thinking about how you ought to be programming, right? Mm -hmm. Like how you structure the code, because at a certain point, things will just become abstracted mm -hmm. and you won't have to do it anymore. Yeah. Like I think about it in the context of like, you know, parse creating an API, right? Mm -hmm. Like that will exist for many things. Mm -hmm. Like I could see a, like a Squarespace type thing, but for like a proper web app, mm -hmm. right? And you just drag your database in right. and, and you, to go. you never even think about That's it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And so, ironically, like programmers might lose their jobs way sooner <laughs> than they think. Um, well, but and particularly interesting because, like, we actually like this this emerging research right now, which is using machine learning to train machine learning systems. Yeah, right. It's like this meta level where, like, right now, there's a lot of handwork that goes into building a model so it learns the right representations. But like, if a machine can do that in the future, it gets like, even more abstracted. Where you may not even need to be like a specialist because, in some ways, the machine kind of like codes itself. So. So I think one thing that a lot of people are curious about is how you're actually going to build a business around AI. Um, so just for like, we can start broad and then go more narrow. Do you think AI will be like dominated by massive companies like Google, Facebook, um, or will, you know, they will be very successful AI products on the small scale? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually think that there's actually like a ton of room for competition here. Okay. And it'd be interesting to see how all the various companies find their niches in the space. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's two really interesting trends right now, right? I think one of them is the emergence of like cloud platforms, mm -hmm. right? Where basically all the companies have basically have said like there's a long tail of uses that we would never be able to like take advantage of, but we may be able to like provide the services that like power those services, mm -hmm. right? And so like for example, Google is offering like cloud ML right now, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a really interesting development in the space, which I think creates a lot of opportunity. Uh, because it means that there's all these industries that might not necessarily be like AI industries that might be able to like seize the benefit from the technology. So that seems like a pretty huge thing to me. Um, I think a second one, which is really interesting, is like some of the one-shot learning stuff we talked about earlier, right? Which is basically that the amount of data you need to pull off certain types of machine learning applications is going down over time. Mm -hmm. And what that tells me is that there might not be necessarily a first mover advantage in this space where you may actually have collected a bunch of data, but if it's not the relevant data mm -hmm. and also the amount of data you need is going down over time, mm -hmm. then the real big challenge is less data and actually more your ability to build like good interfaces and good experiences around the technology. Yeah, I've been wondering about that like as I play around with it and build like tiny little web apps mm -hmm. and stuff, like how much of this is just entirely reliant on the product as like it's all plug and play. Mm -hmm. And so to a certain extent, like folks can almost guess which techniques you're implementing, which APIs you're using. Mm -hmm. And if they're faster with better engineers and then they have like the magic touch of like the product person, mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any reason why they can't just jump ahead. Yeah, right, right. And I think we're maybe fooled by like the nature of the field right now where it's like, ah, oh, we got to get like the most researchers to go and compete on this thing. And like that is like a big important part of it because they're producing a lot of like the breakthroughs in the space. Mm -hmm. But it is, I think, important to consider too that like there's still like this big open question of like how this actually becomes like effectively part of product. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, um, we did an interview at Baidu and mm -hmm. it may or may not come out before yours. Uh, <laughs> so we might do like a fourth wall jump. Right. But um, they explicitly are focusing on things for over 100 million people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, well, I can build plenty of successful startups or businesses right. for less than 100 million, maybe even a million. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think there are just all these fantastic opportunities for people. And yet folks seem to be focusing on very similar implementations, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's like chatbot or yeah. like, you know, customer service, which I guess is effectively the same thing. Um, why do you think that is? Is it they just like follow what seems to be like the market leader or are these like the most obvious? Yeah, I think people are also still trying to figure it out, right? Yeah. Like, um, and I can't, I think we can't avoid like that AI is like a technology, mm -hmm. but AI is also like a, like a position. It's a marketing position, right? Which is, I think is actually like a really key part of the picture, mm -hmm. right? It was like, why do we think about like Siri or like the Google Assistant? as like AIs, but we don't necessarily think about like the Facebook newsfeed as an AI, mm 
right? Like these are all systems that are all powered by machine learning. Right. But there's something about like it's it's representation as like, oh yeah, this is a machine that talks to you. Right. That like makes our brains snap immediately to like pop culture, you know, equals AI, right? right. And I think that ends up being a really big part of it too, is that there's a lot of incentives to like correspond to what we think of as AI. Um, even though like some of the most powerful AI applications may not even come in the form of like a personified, you know, personality. Well, I think that's a that's a super interesting angle. It's like out here, seemingly, it makes sense to like raise your money as like an AI business. <laughs> right. But like when you look at Facebook, right? Facebook, if you log in, doesn't say AI anywhere, mm-hmm. uh, and clearly they have a lot of people using it. Um, so I wonder if it is like a massive positioning thing that many companies do end up missing, because you just have to get like the nerdy people interested in it to mm-hmm. sell it, to raise the money if you're going to do venture backed or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then your end user is like, uh, why am I paying all this money for this like chat bot? Uh-huh. <laughs> this thing. Um, I mean like for example, yeah, if you want to talk about like one of the most critical applications of machine learning to date, it's like spam filters, right? Oh, like spam yeah. is like this incredibly huge systemic problem on the internet. It is like largely contended with by machine learning right now. Like that's like largely the tools that we use to deal with it. Yeah. And like yeah. that's like an application that we never think about, right? Like so, so many, uh, like many, with many technologies, the most important applications will be some of the least visible. Hmm. So what um what are you excited about? What are you going to build? What are you going to build with AI <laughs> In space? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got to think about it some more. I mean, I you know I'm really interested in these kind of like small scale machine learning projects. Um, I think we might have talked about it earlier, but like uh, we had this really crazy story where it turned out that there was this cucumber farm in Japan that was using machine learning to build oh. like a really cheap machine learning like robot yeah. that would sort cucumbers. Because it turns out like cucumber sorting is a really big problem in the machine uh, in the in the cucumber farming space. Right, and and that was basically just trained using like three thousand or four thousand like photos of cucumbers. Yeah, uh, and that was sufficient to train a model to do but, like a pretty good job at like sorting cucumbers. And like, so like, I, I'm really interested in this kind of like artisanal machine learning mm-hmm. where like, it's like, what are these kind of like very specific daily problems that I have? Mm-hmm. And it's a good way of, I think, wrapping my head around like, okay, what are actually going to be like the practical uses? Not necessarily like the like Cadillac uses that I think we're being, we're seeing right now, which mm-hmm. are like the demonstration uses of the technology. And then you can open up like Tim's general store online. Yeah, that's And right. people like download <laughs> like Tim's cucumber app. Right. <laughs> so like, I, yeah, I mean, uh, my, uh, I, I cracked my iPhone uh-huh. uh, earlier and um, was getting it fixed this morning. And the guy had an entire box of assorted iPhone screws uh-huh. from, a, from literally like an iPhone, you know, iPhone uh-huh. one uh, to an iPhone seven now. Oh, wow. And these are just like, He's got like a side hustle of uh, buying and selling iPhones that are like broken online. And if they're totally damaged, he just like strips all the components. Mm-hmm. But he spent like half an hour like trying to figure out what screw would fit. <laughs> so like, there you go. You can like use like Tim's screw identifier. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like, it, it's super handy stuff. Um, yeah, I think it will be like just a lot of small things like that. Um, and what's particularly interesting is like going back to a little bit what we were talking about earlier, like what is the cost of solving a problem through machine learning? Right. And what is the cost of solving a problem through like traditional coding? Right. And that's actually maybe one way of thinking about the problem, mm. right? Like for example, for computer vision, right? Like now the economies are way in favor of machine learning. It's just a way easier to design a, an effective machine learning image, image recognition system mm. with, yeah, with ML than it is with like traditional kind of coding techniques. Mm-hmm. And I think that's actually one really interesting way of thinking about it is for a given task, how long until machine learning is like the preferred way of solving this problem with the computer. Mm, it totally makes sense as like new kinds of entrepreneurs pop up in these like very small niche things mm-hmm. that are essentially like one developer projects mm-hmm. that previously like might have even seemed like way too laborious yeah. to spend your time engineering. Like you're never going to pay someone to do it. You're not going to do it yourself. But, you know, you start plugging into like these cloud ML things and all of a sudden you have this app. Right, right. Um, As far as distribution, I don't know, like I've heard more and more people talking about like localizing certain things to the device, Mm -hmm. which makes them amazing. Yeah. Um, Have you experimented with that yet? Yeah. So we're actually working on a little bit of research around that. I haven't played around with it myself, but uh, for example, there's a couple papers around what they call federated learning, Mm -hmm. where we're just exactly working on this premise, which is the bet is, okay, well, what happens in a future where the edges of our network, like the phones, like have way more powerful processing power? Like, is it possible for us to basically do the majority of the training for these systems, like on device and with like basically a lot less data kind of like flowing into the cloud? And the idea was basically like the, the, the local model would update 
and then it would share its learnings with all the other devices in the network. Um, and it's like a really interesting way of thinking about how you actually do this, because what you ideally want to have is uh, models that are loaded on the device right. and can also train on the device as well, right? Because right now, one of the ironies is that there's big this disparity between like training, which is computationally intensive, data intensive, and then actual execution, right? Which can be actually like pretty low, low uh, computational. Intensity. It also creates a giant latency problem with everything that's like in big quotes AI right now. Like, you know, for most people, if you give them Siri, they're like, oh, it's constantly broken. <laughs> But if you could communicate it with it in a way that's like, eh, you didn't understand, let me go again immediately afterward, all of a sudden the experience yeah, is entirely that's different. Right. Yeah, and latency ends up being really key, not just for like conversational interfaces, but you think about like, you know, for example, like how do we deal with like using this in medical, right? Where you need, may need a response really soon if you're going to use it for like diagnosis or whatever. Totally. Like if this thing turns into a robot surgeon arm and I move it to the Amazon, like <laughs> I can't rely on my like, you know, hotspot yeah. to connect it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I think, again, we're like talking about implementation, which ends up being like this really big piece of the AI picture, which is still being worked out. Like, we know we can get machines to do these remarkable things. The question is, like, what do people actually want out of it? So I guess uh, one of the last questions I have for you is, you know, people are interested in AI machine learning across the board, uh, or at least people paying attention to this are into <laughs> it. If someone wants to get more into it, and they're thinking about like, uh, how do I position myself? Like, what should I pay attention to? Where should I focus? Because like, you know, now tens of thousands of people are, are checking it out. Um, what would you say? What would you focus on? So I think there's two really interesting problems in the space right now that like desperately need more people to get involved in and more people to kind of like, if, like organize events around. Okay. So one of them is, I think this like security uh, thing, right? Where like in the traditional computer security space, we've got like events like Capture the Flag, where people can kind of like show their mettle in their ability to kind of like secure and compromise systems. Mm -hmm. I actually think we really need that in the machine learning space. And I'd be really excited to see that, which is like, so imagine a game where like you have to train a machine learning model on a set of data mm -hmm. and then people will take turns trying to like get past your computer vision system. For uh, instance, cool. Uh, which I think would be super cool to do. Um, and I think like that's one big piece of it that I think would be really cool for people to work on. I think the second thing that's about to be in really strong demand is thinking about the visual dimension of this, right? Which is like, it happens on a couple levels. That's both like the interface of how you work with machine learning systems, mm -hmm. but also just like visually how you represent a neural net. Mm -hmm. Like if you've read the technical papers, one of the things that you'll see is just like, that it's like largely written by machine learning experts. And so like, they don't really have a good sense of like, how do you visually portray what a neural net is doing? And that stuff ends up being incredibly important for people to like both understand the technology um, and and also be able to like use it effectively. Mm. And so I think that's another thing that's about to come on the way is like basically a really high demand for people who understand this research and could give it good voice in terms of like representing it visually. And then if someone isn't into machine learning yet, mm -hmm. what would you recommend they read, study, uh, watch? Mm -hmm. What should they check out? So, I mean, I, I think it's really nice because we're now living in a world where there's a lot more resources for how to learn about machine learning. So uh, I'm a huge fan of Ian Goodfellow's textbook on deep learning. Um, it was really funny. I was in Cambridge picking up a physical copy of this textbook because MIT Press is the publishers. And the guy selling me the book was like, this is like the Harry Potter of technical guides <laughs> because it had been like flying off shelves so aggressively. Uh, so it's, it's really good, though. It's, it's, the reputation is very well deserved. Okay. Um, and I, you know, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is kind of like the history of all this, right? Like, it's important to recognize that like AI has been through this hype cycle before, and there have been long AI winters where this technology has totally oversold itself. And it's like important to understand those dynamics. So two books I'll mention, one of them is John Markoff's Machines of Loving Grace, uh, which is all about kind of like the history of AI and particularly its competition with the notion of uh, uh, IA, right? Intelligence augmentation, okay. uh, which I think is a really interesting battle that we're having right now, right? In terms of like what this technology is really about and what it should be used for. Um, a second book that's just great, which is also by MIT Press, is uh, Cybernetic Revolutionaries, okay. which talks about basically the Chilean Allende government. So it's basically the socialist government like during the mid 20th century. Um, and they tried to basically set up a project called Project Cybersyn, where they were like, let's automate the entire economy. Whoa. So all factories will have to produce data links that will connect to a single central command center where we will like actively control the economy. Uh, and it's a great initial, exa another example of kind of like, oh, like kind of like, 
the the history of cybernetics but also it's like implications for like what people try to do back then that i think useful for like you know making sure we understand what the limitations of the technology are today that's very neat i haven't read that i will absolutely check it out um cool man so if anyone wants to follow you online where do they go oh sure i'm uh i'm on my website is at tim huang t-i-m-h-w-a-n-g dot o-r-g uh, I'm not the Korean pop star of the same name. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter at Tim Huang. So at T-I-M-H-W-A-N-G. Very cool. All right. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Craig.